I love the album cover for Piano Man. It <laughs> doesn't, I mean, it kind of looks like Prince, um, you know, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like the, and, you know, almost has like a Jesus Christ superstar. Oh. Is that what I'm thinking of? Or is it's it a, a Godspell? Maybe it's Godspell I'm thinking of. Like, just like the face, you know, just like him, you know, looking back at you kind of thing. It's, it's kind of, it, I don't know. It's, it's haunting in a weird way, but it's also, like you said, comforting. It too. looks like know. a ghost. It looks like a ghost. Yeah. And it was funny because I used to have the cassette. I had a cassette uh, with the album cover on it, of course, and I remember, I remember my parents finding the cassette and this ghostly image, and they were like, "What kind of demonic music are you listening to? What is this?" And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, like, this is like the most like mainstream <laughs> music you could probably listen to. This is wholesome, right? Billy Joel's Piano Man turns 50 this week. What a better time to analyze the record as a document of history than on such a milestone anniversary. And who better to talk to me about it than my friend Jack. As an English professor, Jack is very familiar with using primary sources, including often overlooked ones like pop music records. He also is the person who introduced me to internet radio several years ago when we would hang out in his dorm room and email the DJ requests for Billy Joel songs. But first, Paul was a visitor to Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire this summer and stopped by my exhibit table. Before I knew it, he was telling me an incredible story about working as a roadie for the bad boys from Boston, Aerosmith, when they were first starting out. I had to have him walk this way back to the beginning of the story so I could record it and let you all have a listen. back then the concerts and we yeah. go down to the Cambridge concerts and you would see different people Graham Nash uh, people from Four Way Street you know uh, it was amazing some of the people that you would see Oliver Guthrie uh, and that's what we would do we I lived in Natick at the time there would be three or four of us mm-hmm. that would ride our bicycles out to Cambridge to the Cambridge Common mm-hmm. we'd find a side street, lock our bikes up, and go enjoy ourselves for the day and yeah. ride our bikes back home. What an incredible time, because that was like, I mean, if we, we were to say rock and roll started mid-50s, right? You know, started with, you know, put a mark there. We're talking only, that's a solid 20 years, 15, 20 years of rock and roll, mm-hmm. and yet you're still being able to access these artists you know, because nowadays, if you go to a rock concert with a name even half as big as some of the ones you just mentioned, you're just dropping at least 60 bucks oh. for nosebleed seats in the back of some huge stadium. God, yeah. I mean, I, I, I went and saw um, Elvis Costello, what, two months ago. He was at the MGM. Yeah. And uh, MGM Fenway. He played there. And the money I spent on that concert, uh, I probably could have gone to 10 concerts. Right, at, yeah. At that price. <laughs> Even with know? inflation, it's yeah, like, it, you'd still right. be... Um, and so, if you don't mind just repeating that story about Aerosmith, because that was cool. Oh. It, I think a lot of people don't know... I, I, maybe it's general knowledge, their connection to Boston, that they, they're the bad boys of Boston, basically. Uh, well, they used to play in... Um, they had this barn in South Natick that they used to run. It was like... It was an old Dover rug store back then. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking in the early 70s. And we were kids. We used to play Frisbee in a park out there. And they come out one time and they asked us, said, look, can you move some equipment for us? So we did. We moved them to Framingham North High School. And we, they played out there. Mm-hmm. And then they played at, I think, the Surrey Lounge in Ashland. And another place. And we went out and we helped them move their equipment. Mm-hmm. And then they got, they started getting popular. Everybody was there. The, the schools were packed. The bars were packed. They got a gig at Boston College, and we went to help them. When we got there, we were told we couldn't help them because it was union work. And the and so like the roadies at, at Boston College, they, they had to do it. They did all the work, and we were never used again. But when, when they would come by and see, they'd still wave and okay. talk to us. So they were nice guys. Yeah, oh, all of them. Yeah, they, they, they were nice to us. You know, like they very friendly, very open. They weren't malicious anyway. Yeah. They were very 
down to earth. That's really refreshing to hear because almost by definition, when you hear the term, you know, people will they use the word rock star kind of derogatory. Like, right. oh, that guy's acting like a rock star. Like, the, And when I hear the word rock star, Steven Tyler tends to come to mind immediately. Right. But I know that he does live in New Hampshire at least some of the time out in, in um, Sunapi. I don't know his exact address for people to harass him. But, uh, and people say for the most part he's just a pretty easygoing guy. He's not. Yeah, they're, they're down to earth. I think, uh, you know, being a rock star, you got to guide yourself because there's so many crazy people. Out right. There. But you are what you are. If you stay natural, you're natural. Right. And I think that's what they were. They're you, just good-hearted people. Do you, do you think that that's kind of the product of that time period in rock and roll history? Because they were doing – a lot of those groups were, were – I know rock and roll had been around for a little while, but they were doing new things with rock that hadn't really been done. You know, it was heavier stuff. Yeah. And so I, I don't know if they, they probably had to rely on, you know, the kindness of strangers to help them out along the way. They, they weren't really – it hadn't established itself the way that the next decade – so you think of the 80s. Wow. Like the, the metal bands and the, right. the hair metal guys and stuff like that. That's when you get those attitudes of... I bet you 90% of the bands that ever started out had to start out that way. Yeah. Just like they did. And it's... Some of them lose their personality. Some of them don't. Mm -hmm. Some of them become divas. And some of them don't. Right. You know? It's just a person. It's what you are inside. Yeah. I, I guess it does come down to that. I, I just... I got to think that it's like because they were the first of that kind right. of sound that wow. there was no room for them to have that diva you know and then when the, the groups later on in the 80s they already started on that level of like i want to i want to be in a rock band so i can get girls and party all night and do all these things where like like you said they these other guys in the 70s they worked from the bottom up like they had to work really really hard had just to earn to, it yeah because there wasn't an apparatus in place for them to just quickly you know there's no mtv so they couldn't just show up and there were no cds yeah you know i think um a tracks were the biggest thing back then right you know and that was it's either that or vinyl and cassettes were probably just starting to kick in then, right you know and becoming what they were which was a better sound but you know you didn't have the computers all the stuff that you have nowadays right so it's, you had to work harder they did and they because they they knew that what they were working with had its limits and so they had to overcome them as much as possible and it's funny because when you see Aerosmith, the Beatles, bands like that, uh, Led Zeppelin, that they're going to be famous for another 50 years. People are going to be 200 years away from yeah. these groups and still hear their music and go, wow, they were good. Yeah. You know? I, I think about that all the time. Like rock and roll, you know, nothing against modern day rock and roll artists. Like the, I can't, I can't name any bands that I think are going to last as long as... And it has to do with that time period because it was so revolutionary what they were up to in the late 60s, early 70s, that it's like that's the trajectory they went on. I, there's just like, I, I don't know what you could do with rock and roll now to make yourself stand out. It's like almost it's all been done, you know? And, and Yeah. And, and it's funny when we think that way, there's another BM that pops up with a new idea. Yeah. And hopefully it's a good one because... I know they tried some stuff, you know, there's groups that tried to integrate, you know, like orchestra sounds and Techno it's, stuff. yeah, and it's, yeah, it's crossing like, over a lot with rap, yeah. which Aerosmith did, um, but it wasn't really there. That was just because their records, you know, the, the, the rappers were using their records. They liked the beat to walk this way. And that's right. what Run DMC did. And then in the MTV age, they're like, well, the, the two of you need to get together because both your kinds of music are getting popular. So we want to right. cash in as much as possible. You look what uh, like guys like Chuck Berry were doing in the 50s and Otis Redding and, and how that still was popular in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, com, you know, still developing that kind of sound. Yeah, I, I saw the Beach Boys um, a few weeks ago. I mean, what's it's not really the beach boys anymore it's a couple right. guys that were in the band and a bunch of other guys um but it's like they 
they still sometimes write newer songs. They actually covered a Ramon song, which I thought was pretty cool that they went full circle and, you know, a band that was inspired by them is now, you know, playing their songs. But, um, it was like the crowd, you know, it skewed older, of course, people that grew up listening to the Beach Boys were in attendance, but everybody was enjoying the sounds of the 60s. You know, music that came out, you know, in the early to mid 60s was still being danced to and, and cheered. It's like me growing up, I used to love the Bee Gees when they were in the oh, 60s. Uh-huh. And when I heard them change their music style over to staying alive, which yeah, it was totally different from what they were. And I was like, mm, I don't know if this is gonna work. And look how popular it was. Right. But I thought personally, the Bee Gees, Bee Gees were better back then than they were. As a more straight up, you know, right. rock right. group rather than disco. Yep. Stuff and. Uh, it's always funny when you discover that kind of thing about a band. Like a band becomes popular for one particular either song or style of music and then you're like, oh, like Fleetwood Mac. Right. So like Mick Fleetwood's early stuff is pretty straight up rock and roll. Right. And then I don't even really know how you would describe Fleetwood Mac other than just kind of like progressive rock, I guess, or blues, fusion. It's it's hard to, to label them necessarily, but... That's a group that's been through a lot of different... It's even, even got a twang of folk in it. Too, yeah. With the ballads that the girls do. Right. The and then, you know, yeah. And then, you know, um, I, I, I like how Fleetwood Mac is almost kind of like a an organization that people join from, you know, they come and go. Like, Lindsey um, Buckingham has, like, been in the band sometimes and other times he's not. And he has kind of like a, a more straight-up rock and roll sound... Like, whenever I think of Summer Vacation, I always think of the movie National Lampoon's Vacation with his song at the beginning, right. Holiday Road. And uh, it, it, and when I found out, I'm like, oh, that's the guy from Fleetwood Mac? I had no idea. It doesn't sound like one of their songs at all. I think that was the biggest shame about Fleetwood Mac is that they messed around with each other too much. And it, it imploded. All those relationships yeah. imploded them. And it tore them all apart. But their music, some of their music is will last forever. Yeah, it, it will. It will. I, and I've only kind of recently gotten more into them. Like I wasn't like super into them for a while, and then right. my wife um, kept playing a lot of like the, their CDs and stuff. And I'm like, oh wait, I like these because yeah. they're going back to where we started with. They're authentic. It's it's it seems like it's coming from the artist, not from. A producer or something saying now you got to do this it's like they were behind it oh they definitely did it their way i love having this conversation that incorporates technology so much and for those of you listening because you can't see it uh behind us is a uh 18th century cooper showing his craft which is like the oldest trade you know it's been around for centuries and here we are with microphones talking about rock and roll and how uh, doing a podcast but Paul thanks for so much for stopping by and let me put this down on my, my show and I hope that uh, the listeners enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed hearing it Rock and Roll was in an interesting spot in the early 70s as it was easily on its third generation of bands and fans already but was being pushed and pulled into several different directions not unlike American society itself honestly Aerosmith's rapid rise to prominence is evidence of many listeners favoring a harder, louder sound than what had come before and other contemporary options. Billy Joel was and is a contemporary of Aerosmith and has produced nearly every style of rock and roll in his more than 50-year career, but it's his second album that gave him the title The Piano Man. The album represents the other side of the spectrum of listening options of the early 1970s from Aerosmith, a softer rock and roll. Looking and listening closely to the record Piano Man, especially five decades later, reveals a musician trying very hard to find his voice and claim a noteworthy piece of the pop music world. Here's Jack and I deciding what else this album can tell us about Billy Joel himself and the world of 1973. Being joined 
today by Jack, uh, Professor Jack. He is a, a college instructor, a English instructor, but more than all of that, he's a a good friend of mine. I've known Jack since our years going to school on the shores of Lake Ontario in New York. Jack, this is I think this is a a long time coming. We've been we we you know we've been meant to do this for years. So welcome to the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. Thanks, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, I appreciate that. You uh, were the one that you introduced me to internet radio. Um, I think before <laughs> really podcasting took off, I remember hanging out in your dorm room and you had your internet radio station on, and I was just kind of like amazed that those weren't more well-known or w- more widely used back then because I'm like, well, this is brilliant. You don't have to worry about trying to tune into the station. You just have to have good internet hookup. You know, why isn't everybody doing this? And now 20 years later, everybody is doing it. Um, but, and you know, that was like before podcasting, but uh, what got you into internet radio? And I, I should also say you were the first person to introduce me to Facebook too. I'd never knew about Facebook until you started using it. Yeah, uh, you know, and there's no risk any at this point of like dating ourselves. So <laughs> I think one of the nice things about uh, that time period is that these things seemed relatively new, uh, even though I think by the time, uh, you know, I was uh, talking to you about it, you know, uh, Facebook had been around at least for a couple of years. Um but I, it's hard to remember exactly how I came across uh, internet radio outside of the fact that what I was really um, uh, lamenting at the time was uh, radio stations that had, um, you know, uh, disc jockeys, you know, personalities, people whose voices you would recognize. And it was at that point that I said, oh, gosh, you know, there, there must be um uh you know somewhere uh, out there still where you can see some of that and this is you know we're talking about you know the 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 uh, early 2000s you know 2000 yeah 2005 right, 6 right there. so yeah. you know the they still had people um uh playing records but not you know um not in the same way you know everything by the time you know we're doing we're listening to that it's all pretty much computerized, I think. Um, but uh, what was nice about the um, uh, internet radio is that you could, at the time anyways, uh, chat live with the DJs who were broadcasting uh, over the internet and make requests. You know, and so yeah. that was part of the fun is, you know, it said, oh, you know, my friends, uh, you know, are coming over. Uh, we're studying for finals. You know, could you send us, you know, play us a song or whatever. Uh, give us some motivation or something like that. And they would call out our names, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that was the fun of it. And actually to tie it in what we're talking about today, it's almost like the song Piano Man uh, by Billy Joel, where it's like, <laughs> but instead it's a computer man. Like, <laughs> give us a song computer. <laughs> That's man. Right. <laughs> That's right. I will play it tonight. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, I remember hanging out with you and you requested some Billy Joel mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. while we were in that. And it's, it's like that exhilaration that you were just saying. It's like, it's exhilarating, especially back then in those, that first like 10, 20 years of the internet to have that kind of like instant gratification where you're like, I sent somebody a message. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't even know where they are. They could be hundreds of miles away. They could be right next door. But they responded to me, and they're acknowledging me. And that's uh, – I'll never forget, like, in the early, early, early days of online chatting, and I'm talking, like, mid-'90s, Michael Jackson and MTV, they had a special thing where Michael Jackson was going to be in a chat room, <laughs> um, and you could send him questions. And my friend – I didn't have internet at my house, but my friend had internet at his house – And we were all excited for it. I'm like, this will be no trouble at all. We'll talk to him. You know, we'll be like maybe 10 other people. You know, we had no idea like the scope of internet stuff. And it's like, you know, that might be why there's not more internet radio because it's just so wide, you know, so huge that there was, you know, like you said, like, how do you break into, you know, that, and the same thing goes with podcasts and there's just so many podcasts out there that, um, 
it all gets just kind of lost in the minutia. But um, Jack is and the reason why I asked you to talk to me about this album, Piano Man by Billy Joel. Um, you are probably of all my friends, the most uh, knowledgeable about Billy Joel. You seem to you love uh, the artist and his entire you celebrate his entire catalog to borrow from Office Space. <laughs> um, what what is it about Billy Joel uh, that you've loved um, all these years? Wow, that's a that's a great question i think um uh part of what uh well there are a couple of things i you know and i think that you know the the idea about talking about um you know that album as a primary source kind of is part of the equation because uh certain artists certain um uh, uh, you know, television programs or certain uh, uh, other forms of media, you know, sometimes they tie you to a particular place. And mm -hmm. when, and, and because, you know, Billy Joel is kind of uh, um, uh, connected uh, to New York City, uh, you know, in that kind of way, I think when I left for college, um, it was one of those artists that I think, um, uh, got me through some moments of, of homesickness, uh, not to mention, uh, the idea that, um, you know, at one point, uh, I th think there was something really interesting about the, the, the lyrics for me. And so I remember, you know, trying to, trying to learn how to write lyrics myself. I said, well, gosh, maybe, you know, I don't know how to play an instrument, but maybe I can learn how to write, um, uh, song lyrics or something like that, you know, and so I would like practice, you know, over, over melodies that I knew, you know, and, and Billy Joel's would be one of those examples, um, you know, but that, that's just part of it. I, you know, I think uh, nowadays when I kind of look back on it, um, I think it is sort of, um, you know, his, his work is this sort of celebration of, what I guess you might call the the uh, uh, banality of life, the ordinariness of life, um, and that 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 Piano Man album, you know, since it's coming up on the 50th anniversary of that um, release, um, I think what's kind of interesting is that it sort of sets uh, or creates this space for people to think about the everyday and the ordinary. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, that may not have been the case before, um, but there's something uh, very, uh, I don't want to say folksy, but, you know, uh, there's, there's not a lot of, um, uh, uh, there's not a lot of pomp and circumstance to Billy Joel, you know, in fact, it's probably not even cool. Uh, it probably never was cool, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to be interested in, in, in his music. Um, but I think that's part of the, the appreciation is that, you know, it's, if you're going to conceptualize what pop music is, even if you don't like pop music, even if you fashion yourself as somebody who likes avant-garde music or something indie, you know, you can't have that without its contrast, you know? And so there has to be sort of an appreciation uh, of that. Well, that, that's actually a really great way of where Billy Joel steps in and has always stepped in in pop music is, you know, he is probably the first one to acknowledge the other forms of you know, music out there that maybe he's not really competing with it, but is just kind of like maybe taking from some of it or not, you know, like, cause I'm thinking about, um, you know, the, uh, still rock and roll mm -hmm. to me, you know, which came out mm -hmm. later, uh, a couple you know, in the eighties where he just kind of like lists off all the different kinds of, you know, musical genres that have kind of, um, you know, tapered off in different directions from the original form and you know that's like right up there with Huey Lewis singing the same thing basically in the same time with you know Heart of Rock and Roll, and then you know he Billy Joel of course goes on to doing We Didn't Start the Fire, where it's you know it's not about music specifically, but he he so he's almost like the observer, you know, like he's he's the one that he's omnipresent, he's always there. Madison Square Garden, he is always right. there, literally. Um, you know, he's just kind of like. And 
this is an early album for him, but it's aptly named. He's the piano man. And it's almost like the title song, you know, he's widened the lounge that he's playing in into being like New York into the country, maybe the world. You know, he was one of the first artists to play in Moscow, um, you know, during the, the, you know, was that before or after the Berlin wall fell? Maybe right after. Uh, I think that was probably the 87 tour. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So even before, yeah. you know, that was a big deal. And so he's like rock and roll ambassador in a way, pop music ambassador. Welcome. And the way that this program works is uh, we we dissect pop culture um, through a form, um, just the same way that something would be in a museum. You know, so if a museum is entering in an artifact to be on display or to learn from in some way, they would, as much as possible, answer the questions that we're about to for that artifact to try to see what it tells about the time and place in the society that produced it. And so we're doing the exact same thing here with music. And I think we already covered pretty well the status in society uh, for, and the role. I mean, he's a self-proclaimed piano man. He is the character that he creates in that particular song that he um, chose. And I think that lends really nicely to the um, first question actually on the list, which is, what is the material that's made from and how is it made? So um, do you think that the, first of all, are we in agreement that Piano Man, the song, is him, right? I mean, he wrote all the songs for the the album. So that's, he's speaking, you know, kind of, he's putting himself in that position. Does that narrative go the rest of the songs, would you say? Uh, I um... That's my impression. You know, I, I gave it another listen, and um, my sense is that, you know, it's pretty, it really is forwarding this idea of the autobiographical, um, uh, you know, which goes, which goes in hand with, you know, the, the, the era, right, of, that we're talking about, the singer-songwriter. Yeah. Um, but it's strange because, you know, the initial like Rolling Stone reviews of this album kind of criticized um, Billy Joel for for avoiding talking about himself and kind of offering something like, um, you know, uh, these uh, representations of ordinary people, but without a lot of depth, almost, uh, almost caricatures of, of people. Um, but I, you know, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, uh, initial take, uh, maybe because, you know, we're talking about this 50 years later, um, Mm -hmm. and we're not talking about, a uh, uh, an unknown, right. Um, and so, you know, when you have a sense of the artist's background, you know, uh, things seem to make a little bit more sense uh, when you look back at the, at the album. So I, I would say, I would say, yeah, you, you know, you're looking at a, um, a pretty good uh, autobiographical piece, if not uh, uh, an, a list of, or uh, um, uh, a sense of this person's uh, thinking, uh, his uh, ideas that, that sort of drive his music. Yeah. It's, um, you know, so if he's the, you know, he's the songwriter for all these songs um, and recording them. And of course they have piano, you know, he's playing the piano and, you know, the, the rest of the music is, is by uh, other artists in the studio. Um, I don't know. I, what does all this tell you about that, that era of this very personalized, you know, because like if I turn on TV at the same time, same time period, I'd be watching, I believe it's the era of like all in the family. Um, it would be the era of other programs where um, it's more realistic. It's a lot more intimate. It's a lot more like, you know, slice of life kind of thing. Um, it, but it's still comical at the same time. It's still almost, it's, you know, like Archie Bunker is a, 
uh, you know, plenty of people could relate to having a dad like that in that era, but he's also a caricature, you know, he's not really meant to be much more than that. Um, so this album is almost like, if I'm not mistaken, it seems consistent with the time period of, you know, especially in the direction that pop music was going, this is like, it's not a 100% opening up his soul to everybody, but it's, it's getting there. Yeah. You know, and when I was thinking about, about that, that question, you know, what, what, what is this, what is this album made of, you know, and it's certainly all these ideas that you're talking about are, are true. And I, and I like the comparison to, you know, a television program, but I think what marks this particular, um, uh, example uh, is the fact that, you know, because we have the benefit of hindsight, you know, half a century later, you know, mm-hmm. one of the things that it can remind us of is, you know, what I guess some people have called sort of like the materiality of music, like, like this album, uh, like so many others in, at the time, um, were physical objects that you had mm-hmm. to acquire and they had to be made. I think uh, um, I'm trying to remember the the uh, writer's name. There's a book uh, called Decomposed, mm-hmm. um, and it's a book that kind of gives it, talks about this this uh, you know in much more detail, of course. But um, it's it's called the political ecology of music. And one of the things they remind everybody is the kinds of natural resources that go into making albums in the second half of the 20th century. And one of those, of course, is, you know, thinking about it uh, in terms of like the oil that's, ne- that's right. needed. Right. And so w- we don't think about it that way. Just like when we think about Archie Bunker, we don't think about television sets. Right. Um, but when you think about uh, what these programs made possible, what, uh, music makes possible it, it would be we would be remiss if we forget the fact that you know they are asking us to do things like purchasing uh, right. objects and acquiring them and so um i think what you start to see at this at this moment is this sort of like not only the individual artists biography being sort of center stage uh but in a certain way uh, the listener also becomes center stage. Like you are also being asked to uh, listen to my music, to consume the music, to identify mm-hmm. with the music, uh, and perhaps you know, <laughs> perhaps move some units. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if this is also the same time period in which, like the kind of like the another stereotype or another character, but like the record store snob was born. Mm. You know, like kind of you know like the uh, yeah. character in, in high fidelity where it's like, well, <laughs> like there's a gatekeeperism. Like, well, you can't come into the store until you prove yeah. to me that you're going to cherish this piece of vinyl. Like it's gold, you know, right. and even if it's not a gold record, you know, it's like, you can tell me that. And it's I, that, that kind of, uh, it still exists. I think it's almost cyclical. It's like whenever there's a kind of, like you said, physical thing to hold. Uh, there's going to be people who become aficionados, and you know they yeah. they're not they're not going to be snobby to the point where they like, I only listen to one kind of music, but they want like the best of everything. Like they only want to celebrate and be interested in what's the best. And I'd be curious if um, you know, because obviously there's been record stores since there's been records. But I'm curious if this would also be the same time in which, you know, the that classic image of, you know, girls coming in with their poodle skirts and guys like, hey, what's the next hop record? And, you know, that like it becomes much more of a uh, almost like a collector's center when you go into a, a music store in 1973 in that era of like, I am willing to be, a con- but I'm a consumer not only in that I'm consuming this, but I'm a consumer in that I'm very particular about where I separate my money, you know, for this thing. I want to make sure I'm getting a quality album and not just, you know, cause that's another thing too. It's an album. It's not a 45. It's not just a single, you know, it's, you're buying a full album. That's a great term for what we're dealing with here. Um, in a, in a couple hours, I'm going to be 
talking to uh, another guest about a record that was made 10 years earlier in 1963. And in that era, they, they made albums, but they weren't like where they became by piano man. They weren't, um, it was basically just like, let's find a bunch of songs that are similar in theme, mm-hmm. slap them together into one record. And then you have like thematic and it, it was, it was actually the beach boys who, who we saw together. Uh, if you remember, <laughs> you remember? Uh, that, that fateful trip where I got like a sunburn in my eye. Cause we had to stay, <laughs> right. we had to stay in the same spot. It was a free concert in Niagara falls. We had to stay in the same spot and the sun was like setting right down the line of a building. So it wasn't, I was like, ah, like I That's couldn't right. even, anyway. But of all the heavenly objects to get burned by during this Beach Boys concert would be the sun. It was Pet Sounds, basically, by, you know, that uh, basically revolutionized the album like instead of just taking a bunch of songs and because the beach boys were doing it too mm-hmm. you know here's a bunch of songs about cars make a car album yeah you know, here's a bunch of songs about surfing make a surfing album mm-hmm. by 73 because of that revolution that had taken place you know led by the beach boys and followed by other rock and roll groups billy joel is not just like here's a bunch of songs about pianos you know <laughs> this one's like tickling the yeah. ivory and you know right. i like pianos um this you know it's like this is like it's a concept here's my bigger message and that translates to fans who are not listening thematically either <laughs> cuz yeah. that that would be kind of annoying to be like i want to listen to an album here's 20 songs in a row of, you know, car songs, you know, that when <laughs> sure. it, it, it's like, I would rather listen to an album and have it tell some kind of story. Um, yeah. And, and, or make me think about it and want to listen to it again. Yeah. You know, listening with another part of my brain, if I could, I don't know if that seems like I'm off the deep end or if we're kind of discovering something about the early seventies that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, media historians probably have a much, you know, uh, richer context about, you know, the the importance, let's say, of the radio station in uh, doing things like promoting an album. You know, what's Mm -hmm. fascinating about Piano Man is that it's um, one of these uh, cultural artifacts, if you will, that... um, uh, most people might be surprised, you know, almost, you know, n- n- almost wasn't, right? I mean, it had come out in late 1973 and pretty much didn't appear um, uh, on the charts until the following spring. Um, and uh, I learned this, too, and kind of reading a little bit about this, that um uh, there was something like a timetable for artists when they put out a new album. And, uh, you know, if uh, it wasn't getting any airplay or if it wasn't um, uh, being purchased in its initial printing, um, you know, there was a term for it. It was like the term was stiff, right? Uh, that is an artist uh, uh, would be referred to as, as a stiff or the, or the album itself would be referred to as a stiff. Uh, the, and that is something I, I, I came across in reading Keith Yates's memoir. Um, and Keith Yates uh, uh, was, is an audio engineer of some type um, that uh, wrote this piece, uh, I guess, an, a, a, a long time ago, but recently kind of went back um, and, and reflected on this again. Uh, and that was uh, the way that uh, he and his friend in college, they were community college students uh, in Fresno, and they were working, as far as I can tell, in the campus newspaper uh, called The Rampage. And uh, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, they, he was cleaning out um, his boxes because as a music critic back in the day, you would get 
promo copies, like promotional mm-hmm. copies of albums, and he would just collect these in his in his uh, uh, at his house, and he just have writes about how he collected boxes and boxes of these things, and um, one day is clearing all of that out and sees this strange cover you know, the one that we're talking about here and uh, decides to play uh, the Piano Man album, uh, falls in love with the album, shows it to his friend. Um, and they uh, he writes about this story um, about how they, they waged this long campaign to try and get this artist uh, recognized and noticed. Um, and they go through uh, the local promotions desk at Columbia Records in California um, that doesn't want to have anything to do with Billy <laughs> Joel at that point because he'd already been, uh, the album had been uh, out for about three or four months, and apparently that was old news, and they had no money to go back and promote something that came out and didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so the, then it was like a hunt, for finding old copies, any copies that were left over that they could then try and get played on the radio. And so they tell this story about how they uh, would encounter people at local radio stations because they were working part time there and tried to get the album played. DJs don't want to have anything to do with it either because it's, again, old, you know, three, four months. Um, and anyway, the story kind of culminates. And it's a, it's a really interesting memoir, but um, if you take a look at this uh, story, what's, what's fascinating is that they take the surviving uh, uh, copies of the Piano Man album and they start playing it at the local record store. And they end up signing up, a, uh, setting up a petition and getting local uh, people to try and like uh, get copies of uh, the Piano Man album, which at this point, you know, Columbia Records is not going to be producing any more of. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it goes on to tell the story about how because of that campaign, um, they end up uh, uh, getting uh, Billy Joel's record played on a local radio station that was that had a big audience. Um, anyway, uh, as you can imagine, this gets to Columbia records and all of a sudden there's an interest once again in Billy Joel's album. So according to Yates, anyways, you know, um, he and his friend, you know, wage this campaign and kind of save piano man from the dustbin of, of history. Um, was, uh, was Billy Joel aware of this? while it was happening or has he learned of it afterwards of this campaign to basically bring him back to popularity? Uh, That's a good question. I'm not sure, but the producer of the piano man album, Michael Stewart was aware because, um, you know, they, they were, these are all people as far as I can tell from the story that knew each other. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, this is, and this is of course, you'd have to sort of have a sense of what the climate was like in California, I suppose, in the early 1970s to sort of know, you know, um, how people might have known each other, I suppose. But, um, but uh, no, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure to what extent um, Billy Joel's aware of that, aware of it, other than to say, most likely he was aware that the album uh, started had to sell gone. better. Yeah. 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 And then, um, Maybe you know, he's learning of it just now by listening to this podcast. He's like, oh, oh, oh I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a neat, uh, kind of a neat story. Um, if you're able to find it, um, if you want, I give you the title. It's a, 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 go ahead, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's called uh, "The Time a Stiff Caught Fire," and it's uh, by Keith <laughs> Keith Yates. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting read because you kind of get a sense of what it's like to be on the ground floor of something like that. And I'm glad that you actually brought up, I mean, that was an incredible story for saying, thank you for sharing that, but also the, the terminology stiff record, because there was a, later in the seventies, there was a record company out of England called that. Um, oh. <laughs> and it was like, they produced mostly like punk and new wave stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like they were using the industry terminology 
you know, on purpose to kind of <laughs> right. like, yeah, it's like loser records, basically. Like uh, you know, nobody's going <laughs> to want to listen to us anyway, but, sure. you know, or, you know, kind of like under promise and over deliver mentality of yeah, know, this album's no good. Um, but I mean, that was the whole mentality of that, that particular movement was to upend the entire system and mm-hmm. just do your own thing. And whatever happens, yeah. happens. If you're, if it becomes embraced, then great. If not, whatever you know you just got to do your own thing and perhaps that was you know maybe billy joel himself was a little bit ahead of that you know i think when an artist makes a record i would hope that they do so hoping that it will speak to people it will resonate with them they'll want they'll enjoy it they'll listen to it they'll ask for those songs in concert but it wasn't so you're not saying it was like five years later or 10 years later it was like just a few months later after the album debuted that they people started latching on to it a bit more well what ends up happening is that the album becomes uh, uh, the demand becomes enough for them to continue the run of printing new ones because it was getting it starting to get airplay mm-hmm. and by spring of the following year um so the album's released in the fall of 73 in spring of 74 it finally makes the charts um and i think gets as high as 27 um yeah you know and you know which for an album you know to do that three or four months after uh, after being released, you know, that's, uh, that's something to note. And that just goes to show you the power that individual people had in, um, you know, mobilizing themselves and local, uh, record stores, local radio stations to ask for, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and demand, uh, uh, a particular artist, you know, uh, where it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like that's what, you have today certainly so the whole the whole thing is kind of different it's a it's an odd story it's one where because usually and i think even before this album and definitely afterwards they usually it's the other way around where like they'll start releasing singles you know to kind of appetize the the listening audience yeah. and then the album you know as we say now right. drops you know they right. it shows up <laughs> and people go and buy it where this seems to go in reverse order than that. Um, yeah. And, but yeah, I, I love what you say about the idea of the individual parties being involved. And it says something also about that time period that like, if I had to go to a radio station, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like I know where they are kind of, you know, but yeah. a lot of times the physical station is totally off the grid you know, and right. it's not like you just go to their door and knock on it. Um, if you send a letter in the mail, I'm sure it just gets full of, you know, all their other mail that they get. Yeah. And it's just like, it's, they're almost on like a high tower that we can't reach nowadays. And maybe I'm not, yeah. you know, in, in big music, in big markets like New York city, they are in big skyscrapers. So it's not like you yeah. can just go to them and be like, yeah, I, I, do you have any of that Billy Dole? Like, could you, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I don't even know yeah. if they do like in, in a modern era, like the, the request lines, like they used to, you know, where we were talking about earlier, the internet radio yeah. kind of took right. over that job. So it, it says something about the time period. I was actually talking to a gentleman um, and maybe I'll air his story uh, as a short before this episode. And so I'll have to delete this right now. Um, But the, uh, (laughs) I was talking to a gentleman last week in, as one of my uh, podcast karaoke guests. And he's, he said he's from Natick mass, which is outside of um, Boston. And he told a story about one time around the same time period, like early seventies, 1973, probably he was playing Frisbee with his friends in the park. And all of a sudden like Aerosmith just showed up. (laughs) And, you know, they had a van because that's they were, you know, and they asked because they were teenagers and they're like, hey, could you guys help us load up, 
load some equipment into this uh, high school gym that they were playing that night. And they said, sure. And then from that point on, for the next few months, they were basically their unofficial roadies for Aerosmith because wow. that's the kinds of shows they were doing. And um, I, I always feel like the the punk scene from a couple years later tries to make the claim of being the the DIY, you oh, know, yeah. real grassroots kind of music form, which they were. Mm-hmm. But other kinds of music were doing it, too. You know, it's it's like and, you know, know, it's like Billy Joel and his fans were doing the same kind of, you know, really pound on the pavement kind of work. This guy was, you know, Aerosmith just plucked some kids out of the field, Mm -hmm. you know, to do, uh, you know, their roadie stuff. And I'm sure there's countless stories like that, a very raw and organic, you know, this is because that era was definitely they were receiving the torch of rock and roll from the first generation, mm-hmm. you know, cause that like the Beatles were done by 70. Um, you know, the, the stones were kind of older, you know, the beach boys were on to making concept albums. It wasn't the same rock and roll as the fifties and the sixties produced. Right. This was a new generation making their music and the way that they were going about it might not have, it didn't come out the same way and it didn't look the same way, but it had a lot of the same elements of those early rockers um, for certain. Um, I think just by our conversation, we've covered a lot of the, that first tier of questions, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the role in society, who made it, how'd they make it? I think we even just, by you know your conversation your discussion about uh, the idea of a stiff record you know why they made it because you know there is a gap from his first album to this one of about three years or two years um but you know that propelling of an artist okay you you need to make new music and you need to put it out there you need to put it in album form um that covers why they made it it's all part of it um it, I think it's interesting that it was recorded in California. You were saying at the beginning of this that Billy Joel to you is New York music, that he is yeah. one of those, like if you were to make a soundtrack of New York that's, you know, piped in through all the streets as you're going around. <laughs> yeah. I, I think Billy Joel would, you know, he'd be definitely there for like the commute, maybe not the commute, but like lunchtime maybe. Uh, but it, what do you make of that? That he, he, he recorded in LA, not New York. Do you think that influenced it at all? Oh yeah. I mean, um, I think it's, I think his name is Hank Bartowitz, uh, who, uh, wrote a, uh, a biography a number of years ago. Anyway, ended up writing kind of like, a um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, an insert for the library of Congress, which had included, piano man in the national registry um a couple of years ago and in that story he kind of talks about uh piano man uh as an album uh coming to fruition in large part because of the failure of the previous album that had been uh, uh put out um and the talks about this this um this initial album uh that Billy Joel puts together and, you know, at that time, and I I guess you have to know something about how music uh, is or was recorded as far as uh, the specifics, you know, and so I don't know any, uh, don't know about that stuff in particular outside of the fact that, you know, individual instruments were recorded separately and then mixed together Mm -hmm. um, from that's sort of like my, layperson's understanding of it right <laughs> anyway the final copy of the thing is uh sped up uh to the point where um uh the music and the vocals are very high pitched you know and so uh, it sounded terrible billy joel hated it or whatever and there's this whole story about him having a party inviting everybody to listen and getting really upset and throwing the album across the room um and uh this is all you know in the the national registry's info for um uh for uh, piano man but uh but it's but it's it's interesting because uh normally this would this would kind of signal the end right because the radio stations were not going to play it and then that's kind of the that's 
you know, kind of the point. Um, the uh, uh, folks who own the record company that put out that that uh, uh, album called Cold Spring Harbor, um, which is in New York, <laughs> yeah. um, Long Island, yeah, right. You know, they they uh, decide they're going to try to you know make up some of the money that they spent creating the album so they send billy out on these tours um at one point sending him to puerto rico at this uh, uh huge music festival um where apparently he does really well people really loved his music um you know and the you know and he's an unknown at this time at the yeah. you know at this point um anyway that original um uh contract was for i guess nine subsequent albums you know, so he had signed all the rights <laughs> and all of that, you know, for 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 the rest of his career, I guess. Um, and uh, so that was a big that was a big issue. And, um, you know, moves back to New York uh, at the time and uh, is then, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, recover from this uh, failed album, you know, and so moves with his young family back to uh, Los Angeles to try and, and, you know, uh, work on, uh, his music career. And in the meantime, gets a job at the, uh, executive lounge, which serves as kind of like the basis for a piano yeah. man. As it it's, turns out. it's kind of funny because up until like moments ago, when you said that, mm-hmm. whenever I heard that song on the radio or whatever, I'd always picture a Manhattan, Mm-hmm. lounge you know it, you know what somewhere in in new york city i would i pictured that whole scene playing out and i don't know if it changes things for me now of you know because la has such a different feel to it you know yeah. now now in my head i'm gonna see like mid-century <laughs> uh very angular uh you know like those like space age looking shapes to everything you know, like he's <laughs> He's like in the lounge at LAX, like playing, right. in the, you know, the, well, the, the album's funny in some, in some ways, because, you know, you see like elements of what I guess Billy Joel imagined country music was, you know? <laughs> and so you see, you see some of the instrumentals kind of play out that way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting. I, I mean, I guess you could say, in a way, in that era of country music was like the outlaw country. It, country really hadn't defined itself, you know. Yeah, it was still country had gotten a huge like just all the the different other kinds of music that had shown up mm-hmm. in the rock and roll age. Just kind of yeah. because like rock and roll has some, er, you know, the early rock and roll has deep roots with country music, and then goes off in its own direction, and then by the early seventies they've kind of refound each other again, you know, artists yeah. like Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings right. and, you know, Johnny Cash was, was part of that, you know, uh, Hank Williams Jr. Like the outlaw country kind of thing. And, you know, Ray Charles was doing country music, it, you know, so it's like folk music, but I don't know, to Billy Joel putting like a little cowboy hat and like, <laughs> like and play like, you like can also, sol- saloon music like <laughs> i mean if you listen to the opening track of that album uh called travel and prayer mm-hmm. um it is an uh, uh an interesting uh attempt at um at this very thing because and actually that that song uh ends up getting covered by dolly parton uh uh so if you ever have time listen to billy joel and dolly parton's uh travel and prayer uh, because they're they're very very similar very interesting um and but it but it almost becomes a parody of itself right <laughs> you have things like the ballad of billy the kid right mm-hmm. which uh as he's pointed out in subsequent interviews you know is not even historically accurate <laughs> um but it, you know it didn't it didn't have to be uh not that it was intending to be parody necessarily but um but the sound right the genre of can i do like a, a something that's that sounds um like it would be a score a movie score for uh for uh a, a western uh, that's movie. that's very forward thinking and very um and i think it kind of answers the next question of who's the intended audience it sounds like he was trying to find his audience that yeah. he and he probably was recognizing what we said earlier that you know the music listeners of that era 
um, they some were the same, like the older mm-hmm. you know adults were the ones who grew up with the early rock and roll mm-hmm. in the fifties, and and the other media reflects that. I mean, this is the same. Uh, it comes out. This was recorded a month after American Graffiti came out. Uh, yeah, so American Graffiti came out in August of 73. Um, Billy Joel records this in September 73. And in, I guess in some sense, it's almost for the same, you know, mature audience who's now being reflective about the last 30 years or so, 30, 40 years and what it means to them. And so, you know, by kind of pulling from, I mean, the, the groups that he was touring with, uh, at this time were also pretty good menagerie of of artists it wasn't a specific style of of music that he was necessarily surrounded by and performing in front of live audiences in that era it was still like you you found some weird pairings for sure if you you know um i remember so i'm you know i'm big on another new york group the ramones and Mm -hmm. when, when they were starting out they were paired up with like they played a show with Toto once, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't really go with, you know, the, they, they toured with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which is a little bit closer, but not, wow. you know, and they, they released a, a, a singles album with him and they're not quite the same music, but you know, they, they shared an audience of like, yeah, like rock and roll, man, you know, just a general rock and roll audience um, for the time period. So like Billy Joel, his intended audience is, pretty much anyone who's going to listen to him, you know, and yeah. not, and that's, that sounds pathetic. That sounds like he's, you know, please listen to me. You know, <laughs> do you, do you want to hear a rap song? Do you want to hear this? Right. You know, I could do those. Yeah. Um, but it's like, he is because piano itself is very versatile, yeah. surprisingly versatile instrument. It fits in mm-hmm. with pretty much all forms of music. It's, in a, in, whenever you see like somebody writing like a Broadway musical or something, it's always a piano that they're at plunking away, yeah. trying to come up with. So that instrument is very much, it can, it can serve its purpose in all these other kinds of forms of music. Right. And so he can, he can do that. And um, he has, he has toured with Elton John before. Uh, Elton John was was rising up the the charts in the same exact time period. Do you know if there was any kind of recognition of each other in the early days of Billy Joel's career, or was it just like, oh, there's another piano guy? Yeah, I uh, you know I think the um, certainly like the you know I always go back to the the Rolling Stone um, uh, review of Piano Man uh, when it came out. Um, and you know, there was some, there was a comparison there, uh, not direct, but kind of, you know, uh, making mention that, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a group of artists now that are, are doing this kind of, this kind of work. Um, but I think, and, and it should be noted too, that, I mean, that Piano Man was released like maybe four or five months after goodbye yellow brick road is released Mm -hmm. so i mean the idea of a piano rocker of the 1970s is certainly not um not uh you know people are aware of this certainly Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean yeah his there were some comparisons uh i can't i think i've seen an interview too where he's just you know kind of uh an early interview where he wasn't too happy about that comparison believes he's doing different things and um and you know to kind of get back to your point a little bit i think you know part of what's unique you know about this question of audience um is uh you know where the audience is you know if you're talking about uh an american audience that is has become disenchanted Mm -hmm. with some of the ideals um in the the uh you know post 1960s era you know um the way the war had gone the the all the discussions of watergate and what came out after that i mean this is in the midst of all of that 
Yeah. Um, and given that background, given that context, um, the album seems to be offering up um, a message that is somewhat optimistic um, or perhaps even naive at its worst. You yeah. know, so uh, Travel and Prayer, for example, I mentioned that song earlier, is actually written as a prayer, right? So this idea of, you know, um, having faith, you know, the um, the a similar kind of uh, uh, celebration of, you know, the 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 uh, uh, so the so-called every man in, in the piano man song. Right. Here's a portrait of all the people. Right. They're the the regulars. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's where they find meaning is in their everydayness. Right. Their ability to sort of check out for a little while and have someone entertain them. Um, songs like uh, Somewhere Along the Line, you know, this idea that, you know, yeah, you know, uh, you don't stay young forever. You know, eventually uh, the, the end, yeah, the end comes for you, you know? Yeah. Thanks, um, Glajel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you go through all of these songs, right, there is an argument that's made there that kind of sits with what's happening in the country more generally yeah uh, which is to say of course you know that uh you know what we would say today well you know it is what it is <laughs> you know if billy had just if he'd rewritten the title of the of the album to be it is what it is you know maybe maybe it'd be a different story i don't know This is his second album. He doesn't want to get all super philosophical with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I think, though, it's interesting because, you know, the next um, you know, the next two albums are also commercial failures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from that standpoint. And, um, you know, uh, it's his last effort uh, that, you know, makes him a household name. But I think one of the one of the things that you see all up all the way up until about 1982 is sort of this reticence um, in the music to uh, make some kind of a, a political statement, you know? Um, and that seems to be consistent. Uh, you know, if you ever see interviews, uh, people talk to Billy Joel, ask him about things, you know, it was, he's been on the record as saying things like, you know, it's not the artist's, place to make up some kind of a political statement of mm -hmm. any kind um you know and has gotten some criticism for that it's seen as less less serious because of a, a stance like that mm -hmm. uh, but a sort of a, a darker uh, approach to that too is this idea that maybe what we're seeing um at the start of the 1970s is, is sort of uh the the packaging the 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 distribution the commodification of social critique vis-a-vis yeah. popular music you know so like give us your political critiques we'll make a nice album out of it you know and we'll <laughs> and then that's yeah. your that, what today we call that's your brand you know right. now that's you know uh, an exaggerated way of uh, of saying that you know perhaps you know um, there's really no there's an open question from an artifact like this, right. Uh, of what the purpose of music should, should be. Mm -hmm. Right. And if we want it to be particularly provocative, we would say, what should the role of music be in a capitalist society? Right. And right. if you are being rebellious in some way or counter culture yeah. or any kind of thing like that, it seems kind of surprising when you turn the album over and you see on the back Geffen records or Capitol records or, yeah. you know, Columbia records yeah. in this case. Cause it's like, like you just said, like if you're that much of a, uh, you know, shaking things up kind of person, you'd be yeah. going to the underground album, you know, record, you know, like slash records or, you know, something or you know, even when they started coming yeah. up with some of the more, uh, edgier sounding names for record companies and distributions 
a lot of times you'd find out it was just part of a bigger record company. It wasn't actually, you know, like as um, underground or as, as subversive as you might think. Right. And that's why, but I think that's the trade off that, you know, even the most radical of musicians are willing to do. Cause they're like, what good is my political message? If only 10 people hear it, yeah. you know, if only the, the people who are gathered in this coffee house yeah. are the ones that can hear it, I'm willing to sell a little bit of my soul perhaps to the, you know, the cap, like, like yeah. rage against the machine is probably the best example I can think of. Mm-hmm. Like they are outright communists and yet they're, t-shirts and i remember late 90s it was like all i came home I, first day of school i, I remember all these kids had raging the machine shirts on they're all you know singing the songs and, and had the album and stuff like that and i'm like i think they were willing to take the hit of their cred from their fellow you know yeah. communists by being like yeah you know we sold ourselves to whatever company distributed this but our message is reaching suburbia. You know, mm-hmm. our message is getting out into the high schools and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, be that as a, it's like whatever the cost we have to hit for our reputation, so be it. Yeah. We get our music out there. Not that Billy Joel Piano Man, as we've established, is on the same par as Evil Empire, but uh, <laughs> or whatever the album is called. But, um, you know, it's it's that you know, maybe willing to deal with the devil a little bit if you're going to get a wider audience out of it. Um, The last question, I don't always ask this one, but given the title track especially, Mm -hmm. is this prescriptive or descriptive? Most primary sources from media, that's why I don't even bother with this most of the time, most pop culture stuff, movies, TV shows, even and especially music, are prescriptive. They want you to think a certain way or feel a certain thing. Um, descriptive doesn't usually sell because it's super boring. If somebody's like, I was walking down the street, I saw a cat, mm-hmm. the house is big, you know, that that's not poetic. It's, it's just boring. And th- I mean, there's a few songs like that. Would you put piano man? I think we've established that a lot of the songs are, I mean, they may have some autobiographical component to it, but it was just him kind of just throwing something against the wall, see what stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, would you say that the, the title song is at least somewhat descriptive language? That's a great question. Um, I think, yeah, when you put it in contrast to, songs on that album like um like ain't no crime right <laughs> that's telling you exactly how to feel yeah <laughs> like, like, like like you're totally normal like it doesn't you know if you're if you're uh mad at your significant other you know that's just what happens like it's right. gonna be fine um and uh but piano man is is another uh is another uh thing altogether and i think that that is you know um a much more celebratory uh 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 piece probably um you know so i you know i guess the argument could be made for uh it being descriptive though i have to say you know my tendency is to think about these things, even when they are um, set up that way to ask, you know, what's the, what argument is this making? Right. Right? Um, And, and, you know, and I think that, um, that a a song like that, you know, tries to, tries to convey that, that point, you know, that, you know, it doesn't matter what walk of life, um, you know, you choose, it's, uh, probably, uh, going to be a dead end if not for art, Mm -hmm. (laughs) if not for music, if not for being, you know, the, the fact that we can commiserate at the end of the day, um, on our hopes and dreams and their, you know, failures and successes. The, uh, the setting for it may very well have been around in previous time periods and probably looked a lot different felt a lot different than early 70s you know 
piano bar kind of thing. It was probably a lot more jazzy, you know, in the sixties and fifties and, you know, not as, cause it is kind of a somber song. It's not a, you know, there, there's hope involved in it, but it's not as, uh, I guess as a, as an English professor and as somebody who writes himself, I mean, the, the writing in that, that song is so well, it's, it's very much show don't tell. You know, I love how he's yeah. like, the microphone smells like a beer. He's not saying, <laughs> you know, it's like you can yeah. get that. Like, he he totally makes you feel like you're there just right. by, you know, d- going, disc- being using really good language to, to make you feel where you are. Um, but I love your interpretation also of it being like, you know, without the arts, this is... I mean, people probably wouldn't congregate here. Yeah, people go to the bar all the time without live music, but this particular place, I'm the reason that they're here because they all, you know, it's like a spoken hub kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That they're all attached to it. So you got through your very first uh, dissection of a pop culture artifact. Um, Oh, my goodness. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Uh, and, um, if you, as a Billy Joel fan, where would you put this album in your hierarchy? Is it, you know, towards the top? I hate doing like top tens because after number five, yeah. it's really irrelevant, but like, would you put it as most listened to least listened to somewhere uh, in the middle? Uh, the, uh that's, I, gosh, that's a tough one. Uh, I can't, uh, I certainly can't speak for for you know what people mostly uh do with this but I I would say it's it's comfortably somewhere in the um uh in the top uh 3 I think there are 12 albums mm-hmm. um uh but I think this is probably in the top 3 of the one that people get the most probably because of the piano man song is my guess yeah yeah um, that and that it's kind of become his moniker too, is the piano right. man. So, right. Um, so, which everybody else that plays piano is like, Whoa, it's just that there's so <laughs> many songs. There's so many songs people don't know about on that song, uh, on that album. And, um, they're, they're certainly worth listening to. <laughs> well, I'll say, uh, <laughs> it was nice talking to Captain Jack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I just came up with the title of this episode. I, but, uh, I, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I appreciate I appreciate the chat. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, and I hope you all tune in next time to the EPS podcast where everything, including Billy Joel's Piano Man, is a primary source. We'll talk to you next time. I'm heading to Music City, Nashville, Tennessee, in a few weeks to take part in the National Council for the Social Studies annual conference being held there. Whether or not you'll be there too, I invite you to check out my webpage, everythinghistory.com. There you'll get all of your information about this podcast, links to my social, and details about consulting and coaching services I offer. That's everything-history.com. Thanks for listening to the EPS podcast, where everything is a primary source.